and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple. Some of you, pre some of you may know him from his previous comp compendium, where he, where he had the absolute gall to actually give us item creation rules that don't suck ass. <laughs> and now returning with the compendium of Le of legends and legacies, compiling, I believe, four years worth of um, homebrew material. The one and only Kibbles Tasty. How you doing today, man? Pretty good. Thank you for having me on again. Thank you for coming on. I had I had to bring up the item creation thing be, because the the re, the response to that um that has been official when it comes to item creation has be, has been my whipping boy for years. Well, I'm glad to hear it works out for some people. It's been still one of the more popular things I've made, and it's something that I plan to continue on eventually. Yeah, if you're if you're not familiar, I think it was it was either Crawford or somebody else pull, um, did did the line of we left it blank so that players could come up with their own form of item creation, which is very dumb. Yeah, I mean, so this is something I touch on and kind of maybe jumping ahead a little bit, but. Uh... Back when they were making 5th edition, they have the infamous quote about how they were making a modular system where you could make modules to plug into the system. And the example they used at the time was an exploration module. And it's always just been funny to me because, you know, it's been over 10 years now and they've, they've never actually made that module. But that's still how I view 5e is the system that's missing all these modules. So that's I... what I ended up doing a lot. And so the last one was the crafting module, in a, in a sense. It's just that, for some reason, they decided to not make all of the modules that the game didn't have. And so that's why people like me exist. When I think of that modular design, as, as you mentioned, one of the first things that comes to mind is um, wine. Or what's old is new. Yeah. Because that's basically what that, what that was doing. Like old, new, and now the three the three lines within that are all use are all using a unified system, but each ha each is doing their own little additions to it. Uh, so you could and you could use that as a baseline to build mod to build modules around that um, setup. Yep. I know. I know. Some might say doesn't doesn't that sound like a universal system like GURPS? Um, GURPS is not modular. GURPS is the GURPS is that blue bucket of Legos we all had it we all had as kids. Yeah, and I th there is definitely limitations as to what you can build on Five E because it de or D and D Five E because it definitely has you know a theme to it. It's more just a there's a lot of chunks that are just inexplicably absent over the years. Mm -hmm. that, Items was a big one. Or crafting in general was a big one. Yeah, um, I've I've talked about I've talked about this a while back when I did when I did a brief video covering the high level covering the high level issue, where a lot and I had I had said at the time a particular problem has been hyper focusing on the new pl on the new player experience basically the inverse of the problem that World of Warcraft has been having with raids over the last few years. Where with with raids they they've hyper focused on the on the world first crowd, but that's like that's like point zero 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 one percent of the of the top end of things. So you end up and and by trying to make the the raids challenging for them, you end up um, difficultying out. Is that even a word? Um, a lot of the people who are who are who are playing ca who are playing casually or semi competitively. And you, the opposite, by focusing so much on bringing on the new players, is not putting enough stuff to keep the, to keep them around. Uh, and I do th I do think that stuff like item creation falls in, into the things that 
would not be all that important for the new player experience, per se. I know that there's exceptions to that, but but the point but the point is 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 that uh, I think because they they're so focused on bring on bringing in the mythical new players that they did that they didn't think that kind of thing through. Yeah, and I think they, we definitely see that struggle with uh, you know a lot of the discussion about with the D five E online is that you know a lot of people are looking for more stuff. And in some ways, that's kind of where homebrew and third-party content comes in, is that there is nearly infinite content for D&D 5e out there now, and people keep making it all the time. And a lot of it, a lot of it is more interesting than the core material because it doesn't mm -hmm. have because it doesn't have to be chained to certain traditions. Yeah, and it can kind of more focus in on the target group of who this would be for. It's just always going to be a challenge because because there is a lot of it and because the internet is the internet, you know, curation of that can be exceedingly difficult. Of connecting people that might be looking for stuff to the stuff that's being made out there. I've done what I can in that regard, but unfortunately, I'm a one-man show. <laughs> yeah, and it's always a bit of a thankless job, I'm told. <laughs> um, a lot of people with as... lots of opinions out there. It hasn't been a, it hasn't been that thankless of a job for me, probably because I style myself as a tailor when it comes to how I when it comes to how I review things. In the not in the sense of wearing a fancy ass suit, although I do <laughs> like wearing suits, but more in more in the who, more in me looking at something and tr and figuring out who I would recommend it to rather than is it good or bad. That makes sense and is probably a useful approach. Um, that's also the reason why, if you if you look at any of my reviews, I don't use a, I don't use a typical scoring system. I don't do yeah. out of ten or or out or out of five or anything like that because, um, there the, you can you can have a tendency with those kind of things where where there's a bit of ske there's a bit of skewing that happens, as you would think if you're doing a score out of ten, um, five is average. And yet, when we see that with video games, um, seven ends up being average. Yeah, and then it just keeps creeping upwards until people are unhappy with a nine out of ten because it's not, you know, perfect. It's bringing their average down. Mm -hmm. There are some exceptions. I do. I for the longest time enjoyed the um, the four the four people score out of ten approach that Famitsu had had done, and the fact that they would hand out. Um, um, perfect forties extremely rarely, usually once every few years. But like as a bit of an example, as as much as I love um as much as I love spheres of power and spheres of might for both five E and for Pathfinder <clears throat> The only I would not I would not recommend that to people who want something beer and pretzels. This is, it's for people who like who like to customize and tweak, and people who just want a little something different when it comes to their casters, or have their or have their fighters not suck. But given that the, given that this is an attempt to try and get a lot of the work you've done over over the last five years into a into a more co into a more cohesive form. Were there were there any early any early things that you looked on in in that five year period that you um, wanted to revise, and use this as that attempt to revise? So most of the things in here are going to be revised from their current iteration. Some of them more heavily than others. Um, for those not familiar with how I do things too much, most things I publish, including most things in this book. I generally publish them for free originally. That's how I get a large base of people playing the content and giving me feedback on it. As well as just, that's how I model my content, is I put it out there for free. It has sometimes dubious editing, but usually is a, a, a rough polish state. And then as I get more and more opinions and feedback over time, I'll go through and revise them. I, and I usually recommend that things are usually getting pretty polished around the 1.3, 1.4 mark. Um, that's when they're pretty much ready for 
more or less all games. But then the things going into a book like this, they have the additional step of going through and getting, you know, professional art and, of course, professional editing. Um, those also for me with my work will know that editing is not my strongest suit ever, so that's kind of one of the big draws for <laughs> people that already have my stuff, is they would really like some of it to go through a professional editor. But in addition to that, I also blast out, you know, the, the content in the preview form to all the backers, which I mean that's a that's gonna be a, that's a pretty big group of people, and often a group of people that isn't the exact same as my normal group of playtesters. So you get another wave of feedback, and that's usually when things start getting into like the the 2.0 status. Um, with my last book, both Inventor and Scion went into the Kickstarter as like you know 1.6 range for versions. And then had their 2.0 versions throughout the Kickstarter, and that's what ended up getting printed. So here we'll see some we'll see some things drift more than others. Like Warlord has been around for you know I don't know four years now or more. It's it's you know one of my older ones. So Warlord is unlikely to change a huge amount because well it's probably going to get another wave of feedback. It's probably going to get more refinement. It's probably not going to get a heavy revision because most of the, most of the rough edges have already been sanded down by, you know, years and years of feedback. Whereas a newer class like Spellblade or the subclasses, which got less scrutiny in the first place, as they get another wave of scrutiny, some of those are already getting revised. And like I, I just had last week, I put out, you know, three or four new revisions to um, some of the subclasses that will be in the book. And that's going to continue onwards for the next probably five to six months as we'll get, you know, larger and larger batches of those. Those will start to be collected into what will be the first drafts of the book. And even once they're in draft form, they aren't going to be finalized until, well, the final one. Um, so it'll be a mix of things that are pretty close to they are now. Uh, some things like the Warlord, a lot of the spells... They're a bit harder and more robust just because they've either been around longer or had more eyes on them already. Whereas some of the things are going to be stress tested for the first time, really, as they hit, you know, 7,000 people uh, having an opinion. Sometimes those opinions are, you know, it's more of an adjustment to how I need to present the content. And some of those things will find things that weren't caught previously. And then when those are brought up with me and my other, the people that play test with me, I uh, will think, yeah, that probably needs to be tweaked or revised. Most things won't be rebuilt from the ground up because my philosophy on that is that it's like refactoring computer code, right? If you, if you have a bug and you try to rewrite the whole document, you can fix the bug you had, but you're probably going to put a new bug in somewhere. So I always try to make new versions pretty iterative when I'm, you know, responding to feedback rather than just throwing everything out and starting over. That's a pretty high risk move. So sometimes, sometimes it's on the path forward, but very rarely. Usually I want to take more targeted feedback to more targeted fixes. Mm -hmm. So most of what we'll see will be pretty familiar with what we have, but, um, It'll just be future iterations as rough edges are sanded down, as those yeah. I talked about earlier. Um, since you mentioned since you mentioned bugs, have you ever heard the programmer's drinking song? I don't know. Probably <laughs> just because I spent a long time as a programmer, but it doesn't ring a bell. Ninety nine little bugs in the code. Ninety nine bugs in the code. Oh, you yeah. take one down, you patch it around. One hundred eighty seven bugs in the code. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh. Uh, I've, I've had I've had some interesting folk here in the temple, and a few a few of them, and I've, I always make it I always made it a rule with any with any job that I had to find the to find the people working IT and um, buy all of them lunch at least one on my either my first or the or second day or the fir or the first week that I'm there. Um. Just so, just so if just so on the off chance that some that somebody in in tech support finally loses it, they well they uh, when they go on their rampage they'll remember that I was nice to them and not and not do anything. 
Well, my uh, I, I came originally from working in video games, and then after that, corporate software. So both places with, you know, everyone everyone is in the same boat of problems. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm in I'm in logistics, so I can't so I can't talk so I can't pass too much judgment. But I'd like to, since you mentioned you don't really blow you don't really blow blow up a particular iteration or the or the like. I'm curious if there were if there were any instances where, in developing a a certain class or subclass or whatnot, that you found yourself be writing into a corner. Uh, yeah, so I mean, things don't usually get tossed out by the time most people are seeing them, but that doesn't mean that most things I write make it to most people seeing them. Um, these become a little bit more obvious when you get to, so like my, my on my Patreon, I have like a bi-monthly poll where people can vote for whatever subclasses they want. And I always have to put the disclaimer that not not all of them make it, because I don't always have a good idea. An example a while ago, um, just to just to pick a random one, was that they voted for a, you know, a marine or ocean ocean faring ranger, which I mean that's a reasonable enough ID on the surface of it, but you know I take a few stabs at it and I couldn't really get anything that I was happy with to work because you need you know you need to both keep the theme of you know ocean marine stuff, but also make it useful when it's nowhere near an ocean or you know all that. Um, and so I just wasn't really coming up with a design that worked well for that one. So it goes on to what I call the back burner, um, which means it's still on the list. And if I came up with a good idea for it in the future, I'd take another stab at it. And I have dozens to hundreds of things on this back burner of where they've gone, you know, after I've taken a stab at it. And I thought, I think it's not coming together. Or um, the idea itself is not something that can be easily presented. Like another example of something I have that's public and out there, but as I say, it's ne it can never quite be really finished, is like the Wizard School of Innovation, uh, which is where I had an idea for a wizard that writes and can make their own spells, basically. And so I have it out there, and it works more or less, but it can never be balanced to the way that, like, where I would sign off and say, you can use this in your games. Because there's always, it has too many moving parts to fully uh, bring it together um, in a way that you will need. Can, you can make a spell without having the DM look at it and say, you know, if that works, that doesn't work. You can't just fully turn that over to the player. Um, so yeah, I have basically tiers of ideas. Ones that get shoved all the way into the back burner of I'll revisit this later. Ones that I put an asterisk on and say. This is this is available, but it can't really be polished up to the level where it will be a final product. And then ones that make it past those hurdles and get out into the wild, those are the ones that I think can be refined and refined until uh, there's you know a functional product there. As long as it's pretty easy to tell in the first couple of play tests or even just reading it if it's going to work in the long run, because balancing something that doesn't have infinite options is just a, basically a math problem. So as long as you can, as long as there's some version of it that could be fun and balanced, you don't need to know what that version is to know that you can make it to the end of that product, making a fun and balanced thing. The problem arises is when either it's not clear how the idea would be fun, or it's not clear how the idea could be balanced. And those are where things start to branch off into lost products, basically. Yeah, I can certainly get that. Um, I mainly ask because there's there's that whole sh there's that whole saying about about a writer getting um, put into a being put into a corner, and the only way out is to cut off one of their proverbial limbs. Um, so I was curious if you if you ever had that kind of situation in the in the um, five years that you've been doing this, but. I, w I um, now for I'd admit for a good amount of people who are going to be listening to this, this is get this is going to be their first introduction to a good chunk of your stuff. But I, I'd, I'd like to d I'd like to dive into the four classes that are going to be in this book, and and just get a feel for what for what you plan on what you plan on doing with 
with those classes, what they're going to be bring to the bring to the table, and what makes them unique. Even if it's ones that have that are that have dipped into places that other people have in, have in the past. Um, starting with the warlord. Sure. So the warlord is chronologically the first one I made. So that's a good place to start. I mean, uh, of these four, that is. Obviously, it was the third class I made, I think. Um, but the Warlord is the idea of essentially a martial support class. Now, it's not a peer support. Um, it can, it has flavors from basically peer support to support, you know, fighter hybrid kind of thing. And it has a bit of tradition within D&D, particularly um, being a class that was core to 4E. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of things that a lot of people wanted the idea of a leader or support class that wasn't intrinsically tied to magic. So Warlord has a few kind of tendrils into 5E even before you get to the class, right? Battle if you look at some classes out there, yeah, there's Battlemaster with their commanding strike and their rally ability. There's Mastermind Rogue with their bonus action help ability. Um, there's various kinds of Bard. Um, ironically, Glamour Bard is maybe the most close to a Warlord just because of their one of their abilities is a very ally re rearranging one. But none of them quite get there. So the Warlord, for me, actually started as two things. It started as a revision to the Purple Dragon Knight Fighter. So back in uh, Sword Coast Adventuring Guide, Wizards of the Coast published something called the Purple Dragon Knight Fighter, which is a bit of an idiosyncratic name. It refers to a lower group of in the uh, Forgotten Realms Sword Coast. Well, actually not Sword Coast, I think. But anyway... Um, but it, it's not very good, just to, to not mince too many words. It's, it's, it's not a super functional subclass. Um, but it was an idea that some people found compelling, so they'd reach out to me and see if I wanted to write a version that was some more functional, which the generic version of that's called a banneret. It's, I think that's how I know how to write it, I don't know how to say it. Um, so I started writing a banneret, and I was never quite satisfied with the distance it could get from things like commanding strike, which is already a commander's strike, which is already a pretty solid ability. Giving something like that to a fighter in a more unlimited capacity was always a struggle because fighters get so many attacks that they can give away. Mm -hmm. If you let them give it away, give it away all, it gets a bit out of hand. And you always were at the core of a fighter with action surge and all these powerful abilities. Oh yeah. And then on the other hand, I wanted to write a, a noble bard. Um, which is basically, I actually started it more as an idea for NPCs. I wanted, like, the escort quest you do to, you know, escorting the noble from point A to point B. I wanted to have a a kind of a, uh, something that could better represent um, what, making them just not entirely dead weight to your party. Um, but I was never happy with them being a full caster because it didn't really make sense that, you know, having this, you know, bardic leadership presence. You, I wanted the inspiring presence kind of stuff from Bard, but I didn't really want all the magic tied into that. And that was a kind of a common want, where people wanted, you know, to have a support, but they didn't want it to be full magic. Um, so I basically just pulled both of those ideas out of those classes, and I made a new class for them, and that became the Warlord. So those evolved into what is now the Paragon subclass for the Warlord, is the kind of the Banneret, and you can still see that they have a lot of fighter roots, and they still have a fighting style, for example. And they can get up close and fight pretty well, um, but they're not a fighter. But, you know, they have, like, heroic strikes. So they can spend their leadership die, which is the new core uh, resource for Warlords, to empower their attacks, and when they do that, they also buff their allies. So it lets you let me bring in this whole new resource that fuels um, the way they inspire people. So it's a much more generous resource than something like superiority dice because you get one per level. So you end up with you know twenty at twentieth level, which is something you could never have with superiority dice. Um, it allows you to scale the support half of the class as instead of just making more attacks. 
Um, then on the other side, there's the noble uh, subclass, which is just called the noble, mm -hmm. um, which really doubles down on... It was called like a lazy lord archetype in 4e. Um, but the noble can technically attack. They have proficiency with some weapons, including uh, like rapiers and long swords. Mm -hmm. uh, but they aren't going to typically excel at it. In fact, they're going to usually want to maximize their charisma stat. Um, and they leverage their allies, but do it mostly through what's called battlefield presence. Which, instead of taking an attack themselves, they allow a nearby ally to take an attack for them. Um, and this is how you make them not a full caster with cantrips and things, but still able to contribute to a battle in a meaningful way. Because they're now making their allies directly more powerful. Mm -hmm. Um... And then there are still some magical aspects to some of them, right? Like, Paragon has very little magic. Noble has a little bit more where they're, they can, you know, issue commands that actually cast the command spell hmm. because they have, you know, kind of a uh, supernatural presence. And that's that's kind of where I'd, I'd say there's some things here that have, like, supernatural powers. Their, 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 their power of presence is beyond normal, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily magical. Um, and that's good... There, there's kind of an old system of tags that used to refer to the difference between, you know, mundane, magical, between those is kind of like supernatural. Where it's not a spell, but it's not something just anyone can do by trying harder. Mm -hmm. And then once the chassis exists, right... So there's a whole bunch of ideas that come crowding in. I let people vote on these kind of things. So now it has the Chieftain, which is a bit more of a reckless. It's not like tied into Barbarian per se, but it's a bit more of the aggressive leader. They, they can lead the charge. They're up front. Um, you're, bra you're a Braveheart archetype. Yeah, they're a bit more brash and bold, aggressive. Um, they also, and that's another unique part of Warlords, is each of them have a different... Uh, you know, secondary stat they want to focus on. Uh, Chieftain is actually like Noble. It uses Charisma, just in a different way. Um, but then we have, like, Commander. That uses Wisdom, and that represents more like the veteran soldier on the battlefield. Then, you know, they might not be as spry as they used to be. Um, they might not be the top, top line fighter. But they, uh, have a lot more wisdom to share. If, you if know, it weren't they, for there's... how the term has been has been used, I would have compared. I would have used the original version of grognard. <laughs> I know what that term yeah. means in geek circles, but grognard is based on a, is based on a French slang that roughly translates to an old soldier who complains a lot. Yeah, and so they have wisdom to share, and they also they're kind of more a bit defensive. They keep their allies alive. They can pick them up back on their feet. Uh, pretty reliably at short range. Um, and then, of course, there's the Tactician, which is maybe one of the main archetypes you will think about. It is just what uh, it's just a smart bloke on the battlefield, basically. They're not a wizard. They don't do flashy spells. They just look at the battlefield and try to figure out how to make their allies fight better. Um, and obviously, then they use intelligence. So... Would it be fair of me to say that the tactician is for the is for those who want to be um want to be akin to Zuge Liang in terms of te in terms of tactics? Yeah, um, so it's definitely the one that it, it's the it's the thinking person on the battlefield is the person that has the clever plan, and then of course it has mechanics for making it so there's some value to the player having a clever plan as well as some value to the player saying their character has a clever plan. Because that's always a tension with something like a tactician, where players might not necessarily think of the right uh, tactical maneuver, but you give them mechanics to help them make their allies more effective based on their character thinking of how they're uh, developing the battlefield. And one, one of the challenges with something like a tactician is I don't want to take the control of other players' characters away from them. Like, you don't get to just move around your allies because that's what they're doing. That, that's, that, that's their turn, right? Mm -hmm. So it mostly comes up with ways to make it so how they play their characters are going to be more effective. Um, you know, exposing the enemy's weaknesses, things like that, to give them buffs and bonuses to what they want to do anyway. And then, of course, if you want to add a tactical layer as a player on top of that, all the merrier. But 
it doesn't necessarily compel that narrative. Yeah. Now, Spellblade, I can infer, is dipping into those people who want to gish. Right. So, Spellblade, it flips from the oldest one to the newest one. And this is one that I said for a long time I wasn't going to write. But as usually turns out when I say that, people eventually overrule me. Um, so, Spellblade has a long history with 5e of maybe being the most requested class by a large margin. Um, a pretty comfortably large margin. But it's tricky because 5th edition has filled a lot of that space over the time. Um, with various attempts of mixed success, we'll call it. Because you basically have it bracketed by on one side you have the Blade Singer, um, on the other side you have the Eldritch Knight. And the Blade Singer is maybe too much Wizard, and the Eldritch Knight is maybe too much Fighter. But it's tricky because those are both very effective options in their own right. Um, and the, the Blade Singer is not leaving that much on the table. They already have a great armor class. They have full casting, all these things. And then an Eldritch Knight um, has can get absurd AC as well. Um, and is a full fighter, has all the bells and whistles. But it's also, I think, a bit of a there's a bit of a cry for symmetry, right? Because we got the half primal caster with the ranger, the half divine caster with the paladin. So it's just like a natural need and want to have this half-arcane caster. Mm -hmm. And while the Artificer and my inventor both respectively are technically half-arcane casters, I don't think that really fills the void for people because, you know, they, they're, they're too thematically their own thing. Now, the, the so class... Fa the something something that I've learned over the years is it's just about it's just as much about fulfilling the class fantasy as much as it is uh, the in, the individual um, parts and what people want when they when they want a spell blade and I think this is the reason why for some the blade singer and the Eldritch Knight don't don't quite cut it is the, is that per, is that um, combat that combatant who bl who blends both. That they've seen, right. that they've seen in so many other forms of fiction outside of um, tabletop games, right? Um, and that's where comes in the Spellblade's main feature, which is called Spell Strike. Mm -hmm. So I divided it basically into just two kind of gishes. There's the enhancement gish, which kind of buffs themselves, and that's something that Blade Singers, Eldritch Knights can do, right? They can cast haste on themselves, go super fast, attack a bunch. But they don't put magic on their sword and bonk people with it. And I think that's kind of the core of what a lot of people want. They want to, you know, make their sword burst into fly, f fire and smash in a wave of fire and stuff like that. Um, and that's the other half of Gish. That's the spell strike. Um, and I don't think there was any sort... In the, the, in the official material, there's no, there's no... The closest thing to that is like the Paladin Smite spells... Um, but A, those are paladin spells, and B, they are notoriously janky. Um, they, their functionality is super weird. Um, they just don't do the kind of cool things people want. I mean, like, uh, some of them are extremely effective spells mechanically just because of how they're written. But people want, like, bursts of fire and ice and shadow and all this stuff rather than you frighten them. Mm -hmm. Um... So that's what the core focus of Spellblade is, and that's kind of what where I started. I basically sat down. I said, "All right, if I'm gonna write this, which at the time I was basically writing Spellblade for a person, and then <laughs> that version kind of evolved into the one I decided to publish for everyone." Um, the early versions of Spellblade had a bit more of my commentary on the idea in there, but over the over the years, it's been over the months, it's kind of been smoothed out and made more uh, more standard looking. Um, but so the core of it I knew is it needed to have spell strike, which means as a bonus action, you can cast a spell, infuse that spell into your weapon, and then hit someone with that weapon, doing both the weapon attack and the spell's effect. So there was a lot of time spent boiling into that feature of how do you make that work in a fair way. Because I don't want to make a bunch of different roles. I don't want to make it so... Um, there's always challenges with, you know, what's called mad 
um, MAD capital yeah, mul I uh, multiple ability def multiple ability dependency. Right, that's always going to be a challenge. I wanted to mitigate that challenge, um, but also you can't in five E. You can't tie a saving throw to an attack roll directly. Like, I can't say you cast hold person into your weapon, hit someone, and if you hit them, they're paralyzed. Because that bypasses legendary resistance and very good saves that some, you know, kind of boss monsters will have. Um, so there's a balance where I don't want to make you double roll for some, like, inflict wounds, but I don't want to let you just paralyze someone. So, Spell Strike is admittedly slightly complicated feature, but I think it's boiled down to pretty straightforward. And I've not really seen many people struggle with it. Basically, you just combine the rolls. If they're an attack roll, if it's a saving throw, it procs, it procs the damage against the target automatically on a hit, and then against any other targets, it triggers the save. And if it has an effect beyond damage, then it still uses the save, because it has to go into that that set of mechanics to kind of for game balance reasons to let things like legendary resistance work to let things like targeting better or weaker saves work um, but to compensate that those saves will trigger even if you miss the attack yeah um so once i boiled that down um the challenge with spellblade to me is figuring out the narrative like um the narrative visions of the class right because spellblade is to me i think a lot of it's a, it's a mechanical want people want to put you know the fire under the sword and hit stuff mm -hmm. but it's not something that exists in a pure form in fiction i guess i mean it does but most people that can use magic and swords in fiction are just what we call in tabletop games overpowered <laughs> they're just a full you know they're just they're good at both things um so getting a spell blade who's you know all right at magic and all right at swords um it's tricky to find that balance in a satisfying way mm -hmm. and then find what the narratives there are but i mean there are definitely some um so it ended up with the battle maid which is basically the, the most classic pure take those two concepts and not just mash them together, but, well, fuse them together, you know, melt them down and blend them into the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, where the Battle Mage actually is a single attribute of Engine. They make their attacks with their intelligence, um, and they have a broad range of, you know, uh, useful combat spells. There's the Ether Blade, which is just, you know, taking that idea and kind of figuring out what, you know, what interesting ways there are to blend magic and swordcraft. Um, so they actually, you know, create a giant blade made of force energy that then they hit people with. Um, and then there's the ones that are based more around enabling types. So there's like the guardian, the swift blade, and the spell shot. All of which are basically like, if you look at the limitations of spell strike, these are different ways to massage those limitations to allow... A different kind of character but they also then have their own limitations like all of those ones are multiple attribute dependent they want to use their weapon stat still but then like spell shot obviously let, lets it work with ranged weapons and gives you various bonuses to line spells you can you know shoot a lightning bolt kind of thing um where guardian focuses on giving you a shield allowing you to play up that ridiculous ac as well as having ways of you know, shielding your allies and uh, switching places with them and kind of things. Where Swift Blade is kind of the dual wielder focused one, though it doesn't necessarily have to. It's the one that kind of focuses the most on allowing you to use multiple weapons. Um, there are other elements to Spell Blade as well. I think, you know, I think. The popular vision of Spellblade in some ways is also draws from 4e with the Sword Mage. Mm -hmm. Um all similar things. So there's some things people expect to see in there, like the ability to teleport as a feature. Um, which I did bring over. That's one of those that's notoriously challenging because you don't want to give too much low-level teleportation to players. Um, if you, at least if you want the DMs to allow your content. Um so it has a lot of these nods to the classic abilities of, you know, sword mages, mage, uh, maguses, 
all sorts of ideas kind of wrapped up and then wrapped up in a fifth edition bow. Mm -hmm. It's one the one that's probably going to see the most iteration, the most new subclasses. It just recently got a new subclass called Mage Hunter, which was added by my patrons, mm -hmm. or you know, voted on by my patrons. And there's going to be two or three, I think, voters' choice ones from the Kickstarter. So I don't know entirely what all those are going to be yet. I have a list of like. 50 ideas people have submitted so there's going to be plenty of options mm -hmm. um so we'll see what people want there um but it's all going to be stuff that's tied to that idea of ways to approach the spell strike uh, idea basically new ways to apply that more perfect fusion of take magic put in weapon hit people with magic Now, when it comes to the Warden, I'm guessing that much like with the Spellblade, the Warden is lo is loosely inspired by the Warden in 4th edition? More loosely, I would say, but it is that that's where the name comes from. Um, the Warden is not necessarily something that was nearly as, much, nearly as heavily requested, uh, but it came from kind of two observations I had with my own playtesting groups. One is that over time, more and more people were migrating towards casters, and they were leaving groups with less and less of a front line, basically. They'd always be trying to kite enemies with stuff like spike growth, and always try to keep the enemies away from them. Um, but there was, you know, groups that would ha wouldn't have a barbarian or a fighter. Um, so I wanted to give a more complex control oriented frontliner uh to help balance out these groups um both something that would fit into those groups well as kind of a sole frontliner of a you know a massive brick wall presence in the front um as well as a more complicated kind of melee control class so this one kind of started from more of a a need in the market so to speak mm -hmm of watching my own games and my playtesters' games. Um, and what I settled on was the Warden, which is a primal tank, basically. And tank is a bit of a loaded word and a tricky one to do in 5th edition, especially as I'm on the record several times saying I don't necessarily love taunting or aggro mechanics in tabletop games. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to bring... I wanted to give them tools to basically control the battlefield. That's kind of where it started. I wanted to have a melee class to control the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And then a primal tank just kind of dovetailed into that very easily. Because obviously if you want to manipulate terrain, I mean primal is the power source to do that. Because that's A, kind of what it already does if you look at like the druid list and stuff. And B, just what obviously makes sense. Um, so Warden is one where... If, you, if you're looking exactly for the 4 e version, it's fairly different than that. These are m more tied to the natural... Um, more tied to their power source. They use mostly natural weapons of... The Elder Heart manifests vines that lash out and bind people. The Elemental Soul manifests ice and fire. Beast Heart transforms bestial claws, stuff like that. But it's definitely a spiritual successor. Um, and there are some nods in there to things that the 4 e Warden was good at that I've brought over mostly for the sake of having that bit of continuancy with the name. Like, a for like the Warden has a particularly strong ability to uh, throw off saving throws in, in this version, which is definitely something that came from their uh, four iteration, where they could basically save against spells at the start of their turn as well as the end of their turn. Um, so that's kind of the, the narrative that builds out things like how their endurance dice can be used to buff their saving throws as well. That also dovetails into mechanics, right? Because I didn't want to repeat a barbarian or something where is the, the enemies are the spellcasters are trying to control them. Mm -hmm. These are very difficult to control and very good at controlling. Uh, but obviously they have drawbacks. They don't do a ton of damage. Uh, they're very good at grappling, grabbing, making, you know... They have an aura of interdiction that makes it hard to run past them. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they're very, you know, they're 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 a ball on the battlefield that like a gravity well on the battlefield that's hard to get get away from. Um, and they well often win if it's just you know them and an enemy bashing each other, but it's not going to happen fast. Mm-hmm. And lastly is the occultist and. With this one, with this one, you on the Kickstarter page you describe it as this class could be fairly called five classes in one. What exactly did you mean by that? All right. So the occultist is now, for those more familiar with my inventor and scion, they'll get more at home when they get to the occultist and realize that it's forty some odd pages. Um, though actually, that's that's not quite fair. It's not like thirty some odd pages without the spells. But the Occultist is basically my collection collection of all the traditional spellcasters that you could want in a D&D game, but we're going to be a struggle to make a full class. So one thing I've learned over the years is that if I walk up to a D&D or DM and say, here's five new classes, there's going to be some hesitation um, in taking all five classes. If I walk up and say, here's 15 new classes, there's going to be a lot more hesitation. Um, so there's not, the, there's not the license to just make it as many classes as you want. Um, so when you get to narrower concepts, 5e has kind of changed how classes work compared to older editions. In older editions, every time you had a new idea, you made a new class. Where in 5e, classes are sort of an umbrella for characters that have a shared resource. And this gets a bit tricky when you get to spellcasting, because you don't want everything to be a wizard, but you already see there's a struggle to define the spellcasters as is in 5e. Like, Sorcerer and Wizard are already infamously struggling to maintain their identity in 5th edition. Uh, I have opinions on that, but that's a sidetrack and a half. Wizard is kind of the third wheel and all that. But then you get to Occultist. So, Occultist has Witch, Shaman, Oracle, Hedge Mage, Cultist. Um, I'm, th- I'm forgetting one. There's, I think there's one. Shaman, Cultist, Oracle, Witch, Hedge Mage. Right, okay. So, that though, it has all of these ideas that... I could make a witch class. And in fact, there are a bunch of witch classes out there. Oh, yeah. Um, but once that door is open, that opens so many more doors. Because if witch is a class, well, shouldn't oracle be a class? Well, if oracle is a class, shouldn't shaman be a class? Once shaman is a class, shouldn't, you know, cultist be a class? Shouldn't hedge mage be a class? And there's so many more ideas there that... Once I kind of open that box and realize the the well here is infinite, right? Once I start making all these casters that don't quite fit into wizard or sorcerer um, or druid, they, they they don't quite fit into those existing buckets. But there's too many new buckets here. So uh, occultist was basically I'm going to take all of these casters of tradition that follow you know ancient mysterious. Uh, magical um, uh, ways of thought and, you know, they're not quite full arcane casters. I'm going to combine them all into a new, more general bucket. So with a cultist, the class itself is pretty lightweight, right? You don't get a ton of definition from your class. Your class is basically full caster with what's called occult rites, which are basically a similar thing to warlock evocations, and then a handful of additional skills, some expertise, and their 20 level feature, the old ways. But if you look at the actual class, there's maybe less than four to five features. But what that does, that leaves the subclass able to be quite a bit more broad. So basically, it's a container for larger subclasses. And then each of the subclasses can then have uh, kind of more definition within them. Like the witch is a subclass of occultists, but in turn it still has covens, which you might li- or which are kind of like warlock packs, basically. Mm-hmm. Where you can be of the a white coven, the black coven, the red coven, the green coven. 
But these aren't fully fleshed out subclasses. They all share a lot of both the... They basically in inherit the occultist features, inherit the witch features, and then gain some flavor elements to di differentiate for them through their bonus spells and through their familiars. Um, which allows me to have a different uh, gradient, basically. There's larger than normal subclasses and then smaller than double sub subclasses. Mm. Um, it's basically a way to fit a model that didn't super work within 5th edition into 5th edition in a fairly elegant way that people are going to look at this and think, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, um, okay. When it comes to when it comes to some of the other subclasses, um, I'm because of because of who I am and because of, because I got to stick to my gimmick. I feel obligated to ask what subclasses are going to be available for the monk. I can kind of I can kind of get the idea of what the of the brawler on the Kickstarter page and what that's going to be about. But is that the is that the main entry for uh, monk subclasses, or would there be others? Uh, so there's a couple on the monk. Um, let me think. So there is the way of the outcast. That one is I can easily confirm is in there. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the monk that I, I describe as falling off the wagon. Um, they're a monk that thinks, "Why don't I put on armor?" <laughs> so they obviously just wear light armor. But you know, it's a it's, I think that might be the bit of more of a brawler one. They, uh, you know, they, 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 they use their monk-like powers in unmonk-like ways, um, being less of a traditionalist. Um, there's also, let's see, there's the way of the sword saint in there, um, which is not. It, it, it's it's one of those ones that started as a revision of I think of Kensai a Kensei monk I don't know how to say that one someone where I know how to write it I don't know how to say it uh, but it's much more um, mystical and with uh, set abilities right like it, like if you think um, Steel Wind Strike is always a cool ability that for some reason only wizards get to cast basically um, so what if Something like, you know, a blade, a sword monk got abilities like Steel Wind Strike. Obviously, I can't use Steel Wind Strike because it's not an SRD spell. Yep. But if I take the concept of stuff like that, of more mystical blade techniques... Hold that thought. Um, so... so sorry, to, sorry, to, um, cut, sorry to cut off on, the, on that. Um... It is interest. It is interesting when when you bring up Steel Wind Strike because, well, the first thing that comes to mind just from hearing that name, I always I always go back to Book of Nine Swords, one of those things I'm supposed to hate but don't. <laughs> Book of Nine Swords was one of those things that was. I, I do think it was somewhat flawed in execution. I think it was something that clearly taps into an idea that a lot of people want. Um, particularly going back now and reading it, I think that there's a lot of things there that don't work as elegantly as I would want. But there's obviously a lot of there's obviously a lot of stuff there that people wanted. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an evo evocative idea there. Yeah. That I think never was really revisited in an effective way. This is I why think... I this is why I bring up the tradition problem that um, D, that D and D ha that D and D has had. This idea that you have that you have to do things a certain way, not because they're good ideas, but because that's what's always been done. Oh. Well, yeah, Steel Wind's drag is one that particularly bothers me because if you listen to what the designers that worked on the spell say they say that it was supposed to be kind of a ranger capstone spell and then they just decided to give it to wizards as an afterthought but if you look at the spell it does a bunch of spell attacks which rangers are not good at so if you think about a 17th level weight ranger using their wisdom modifier to attack five targets in a flourish of teleports you think that doesn't make a lot of sense but there's an idea to steal wind strike that people really like. Um, so 
One of the things I've done in the book that things like the Sword Saint Monk and other things can tap into is I've made spells and... Well, I've done a couple of things, actually. One of them, though, is that I've made spells that actually work for melee characters. Like, what if you take something like Steel and Strike, but you bring the level down so that it is level appropriate for half casters or other things like that, mm -hmm. and then you gasp, make it a melee weapon attack so they can use their attack stat with it yeah, uh, to attack with their weapon. It's not like there's two. It's not like there's two half casters who are going to be revolving heavily around melee combat or anything. <laughs> right. So I actually have a, a you know one of the, the the many products that get bundled into this is a document called Ranger Spells That Don't Suck, because it's always been part of my contention. That a lot of what's wrong with rangers is they just they just never wrote the many good spells. Like, one of the spells from that is multi-shot. It's just a, a, a thing that if you want to have a magical bow person, and you think of what would they do with magic bow stuff, shooting a bunch of magical arrows is kind of one of them. And it, technically, there's Cordon of Arrows, or Conjure Barrage, whatever they have, but those are truly terrible spells. They, they don't function. Mm -hmm. um, they're just mechanically, they're, they're extremely weak for their spell level. And they, again, <laughs> use spell saving throws which don't work super well for a ranger that's not going to have maximum wisdom or mechanics of the spell that compensate for that. So these are spells that are geared around if a martial person has spells and is using their action to cast those spells, or you know would have to use their action, what would actually be a good spell for them to cast? Because that's like, like, paladins infamously just ignore most paladin spells and just smite harder, because smite has no action economy. Uh, and no no saving throw, no spell attack, etc. That's why Divine Smite is so overwhelming in their feature list. Mm -hmm. So I, with all the gishes I'm writing and adding here, all the gish spells, I want to keep in mind, like, how do I actually make people want to cast these spells? Um... So that's kind of like if I'm making new versions of stuff like Steel Wind Strike, stuff like that. Uh, and that bleeds both into things like the monk that you, uh, the Sword Saint monk that uses mechanics, as well as to all the new spells that are going to be in the book. Mm -hmm. And the other half of that is, <laughs> sorry to continue, but I'm also adding a bunch of feats. Mm -hmm. Some of those are more standard feats, like the active martial feats and the. Um, and the ex weapon expert feats. Mm -hmm. But then there's also what I call the mystic path feats. Um, and these are a collection of feats that give supernatural abilities, but geared towards marshals. Yeah, and I, I, can certainly get, I can certainly get behind that. Um, now, I do want to give my congrats for, get, for managing to get... At, managing to get it just shy of ha of half a million in total funding which means all of the stretch goals got got smashed including the the infinite stretch goal got stretched quite a bit as i got to my it's clear that my you know i this strongly exceeded my expectations like in my best case scenario this would did as well as the last kickstarter mm -hmm. but then ended up doing roughly twice as well as the last kickstarter which is in a word, absurd. Um, but I, I'm happy that it's absurd. It's a good kind of absurd, but still absurd. Mm -hmm. um, but at my 400k one, I basically just put out what I considered my final stretch goal, everything out there, and I'm going to release a bunch of stuff, 100 plus pages under the Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of a longer story as to Creative Commons and OGL stuff, but um, after that I put what's called an infinite stretch goal, which I said every 1k after this I'll add a new epic boon. And I thought that maybe I'd get 20, <laughs> and then it ended up going 450k, so now I'm on the hook for 50 epic boons. That's that's going to be a thing I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to take some doing. Yeah. I got some ideas, though. The moral of the story, this. never tempt the gods of irony. Well, or at least make sure that if they're, you're tempting them, you're getting money for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'm not going to complain about the outcome. It's just a bit of a silly one. Yeah. But with all that said, I I know you I know you had a bit of a um 
a bit a bit of a hard a hard cutoff point, so I won't I won't go too further into things. There's some stuff I I could go into as a as a follow up, but we'll save that for another day. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And once again, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Because as I often say here around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you for having me on. And uh, perhaps I will revisit when I have more time and we can discuss a whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. But I do thank you for fitting it all in. I know that it's difficult to uh, work in through my long rambling pieces, but uh, I think we covered a lot. So yeah. thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!